Did I write them out of it then already? We did it, but you can do it. We did our guitar gyro and whatever. Oh, Akyana Tamira Dasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadha Mahyam Padati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Shri Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Savadutam Parijana Saritam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padham Sahagana Malita Shri Vishakan Vitam Shta Mateka Bando Masangen Manduro Man Mahadana Manistaraka Madhagya Madananda Namo Stute Arion Tatsad Shrima Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 5. Verses number three and four. This is verse number three. De nu nam niyute pradhat viprebya samalankrite tiladren saptarat nogha shatakum bhara bhara pritan shatakum bhara bhara Translation, Nanda Maharaj gave two million cows completely decorated with cloth and jewels and charity to the Brahmanas. He also gave them seven hills of grain covered with jewels and with cloth decorated with golden embroidery. Text number four. Kalena sana shochabhyam samskarai stapase gyaya Shudyanti dhana santushta dravyanyat matma vidyaya. Translation, O king, by passing of time, land and other material possessions are purified. By bathing, the body is purified. And by being cleansed, unclean things are purified. By purificatory ceremonies, birth is purified by austerity the senses are purified and by worship and charity offered to the brahmanas material possessions are purified by satisfaction the mind is purified and by self-realization <laughs> and by self-realization or krishna consciousness the soul is purified Purport by Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Purport, these are Shastric injunctions concerning how one can purify everything according to Vedic civilization. Unless purified, anything we use will infect us with contamination. In India 5,000 years ago, even in the villages such as that of Nanda Maharaj, people knew, people knew how to purify things is a type of here. And thus they enjoyed even material life without contamination. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. So Krishna has just taken birth and they're performing what is known as the Jatta Karma Samskara. So the Jatta Karma Samskara means the birth celebration. Samskara means a rite of passage. So the rite of passage for the child when he takes birth is a passage over the threshold 
um, from the womb of the mother to the womb of the world, and I'm crossing that particular threshold. And life is filled with many such thresholds to be crossed. And this is the very first one that the soul crosses, the threshold from the womb of the mother to the womb of the world. And then there's the threshold to be crossed, for example, from adolescence to adulthood. And in all traditional cultures, they have actual um, external manifestations of these rites of passage, external manifestations of crossing thresholds. And the idea is that the crossing of the threshold allows for the integration of certain um, characteristics that will allow you to function healthily in the new domain. So for example, using the same example, when the adolescence doesn't go through a rite of passage to adulthood, then he doesn't have access to the characteristics that will allow him to function in the new domain as an adult, for example. And as a result, you have a postmodern culture today where it's like a, a culture of children. They're all grownups, technically speaking, in terms of age, but they're quite like children because they haven't accessed the characteristics that allow them to function as healthy adults. So in all traditional cultures and including Vedic culture, the word is used as some scar, purificatory ritual or rite of passage is allowed for the integration and activation of the characteristics that allow for success in a particular domain. So in the Jata Karma, this is also known as Medha Janana. So Medha Janana means like the conferring of intelligence to the child. Often when experiencing a, a rite of passage, the person who's going through the experience doesn't know its value right at the particular time. Um, he just sees, again, same example, if in the old world, if a boy was to be um, uh, given a rite of passage, certain wounds would be given to him by his father, by maybe the man of the town. And the child doesn't understand, the boy doesn't understand why this is important, how this is useful, it's a little bit bewildering but it'll allow him to function later on when he's activated certain intrinsic characteristics that allow for the healthy functioning. So here in the Medha Janana that means the conferring of intelligence, but the child may not know the value of what's happening, but it is said to be conferring intelligence amongst the child. So the Jatta Karma Samskara is being performed for Krishna, the conferring of intelligence, the activation of the characteristics that allow for healthy functioning in the new world, that one is experiencing. And so one may ask the question, well, this is God. He doesn't need any Jatta Karma Samskara or any Samskara. Uh, he is the very source of the world. So why is some Samskara being performed for him? That doesn't make any sense. This is the Supreme Lord Krishna. Aham Sarvasha Prabhavo Matapravam Prabhartite, et cetera. You know, from him, everything is extending both matter and spirit. So what is the purpose of a Jatta um, Karma Samskara for Krishna? That is because Nanda Maharaj is having divine ignorance uh, of Krishna's godhood. And that ignorance facilitates the intimate exchanges between divinity and the soul. Otherwise, there'd be no possibility of having any loving exchange with an infinite reality. Um, like the jivas, if we want to relate to that reality, how would it be possible? I often give the image of an ant trying to relate to a human. Is it possible? How is it possible for an ant to relate to a human? Ants are very small, human very big. If they try to establish some relationship, how would it be possible? The intrinsic limitations of those bodies disallow for any establishment of intimate relation. So we jivas are very, we're smaller than ants. The jiva is actually anu. Anu means atomic. Atomic means not having parts. Even an atom has parts to it. The scientific atom has parts to it. It has an electron. You know, and a proton and a nucleus. I was really bad at physics, but they have all these different parts to the atom, the material atom. And a soul is smaller than that. A soul is literally infinitesimal. Um, it, it's a, the, irre, the smallest irreducible unit of being is called the jiva or it is anu. So because it is so small, it also doesn't have any parts to it. So how can such a tiny limited entity relate to an infinite reality? and intimacy and love. So that has to be possible by another energy that facilitates that. That energy is, of course, the Sarup Shakti or Maya Shakti, no, Yoga Maya Shakti of the Lord that allows for that intimacy. So Nanda Maharaj, like all the bridge Basis, they, they don't recognize Krishna as divinity as such. They recognize him as their child. And in complete attachment and love, 
they relate to him as a human, as they would relate to any other human. And their desire to relate to Krishna in that particular way causes Krishna to actually need the Jatakarma Samskara. You understand? Their need to worship him by their love as a human causes in Krishna the desire to reciprocate with that love. And thus he actually needs the Jatakarma Samskara. He himself feels that need, the need for love that is intrinsic to Krishna's nature actually causes him to become hungry. How can God become hungry? Hungry is an imposition on, of, on the soul of the Maya Shakti. Um, the, even like, you know, for me, like eating is like a chore. It's like, ugh, sometimes you just feel like it's an imposition on life, especially on Akadashi, <laughs> where, where fasting increases and you're like, oh, I'm hungry. I'm just thinking about grains. So I've never think about grains so intimately as I do on Akadashi. So I, know, I become acutely aware. Why is that? Because it's an imposition on life. Actually, eating, sleeping, many, defending, it's an imposition on life. So how is it that Christian becomes hungry? How can he become hungry? He is devoid of any upadi, devoid of any imposition. Uh, he's a very source of the energy that imposes itself on the living entities. So the spark cannot burn the flame. So how can the Maya Shakti burn? It cannot impose on Krishna, but he has need to eat also. So from where his need to eat is coming from, his need to drink the milk of Mother Jasoda, from where that need is coming from. He is also Atma Rama and Apta Kama. This is intrinsic to his nature. Atma Rama means one who delights in his own self. And Apta Kama means one whose desires are automatically satisfied. That would be very convenient. But if, if, if we humans had that, it would be a big problem in the material world. So we don't have those sort of shaktis to facilitate that. So Krishna is Atma Rama, he is Apta Kama, but he has need also. He is as if he is not satisfied, Anatma Rama and Anatta Kama, as if he, his, his needs are required to be sourced from outside of himself. So from where that need comes from, it comes from the prem of his devotees. So the prem, the desire to feed Krishna and um, as an expression, an anubhava, or expression of the love that Vrishabhasis generates in Krishna the need to eat in reciprocation with that desire to worship in that particular way. Thus is the import of the verse, in accordance with the nature of the approach, I reciprocate in kind. Yayata means in accordance with the nature of the approach. So if one approaches Krishna as enemy, then he's glad to chop the head. No problem, just like my favorite story, not my favorite story, but the one I find the most, uh, I find quite funny is when Krishna comes to Mathura and he goes to the, um, the house of the, uh, the Dobiwala of King Kangsa and he and the coward boys have just arrived to Mathura. So he wants some nice cloths so by which he can attend the ceremony the next day. So the Dobi Wallace said, these are the king, these are the clothes of the king. Don't touch them. He says it like in a very with animosity. So Christian just walks up to him and gives him a little, you know, touch in the neck, and the hair comes off. Karate chops in the neck and game over for him. That was in reciprocation with the nature of the approach. He approached with animosity. So Krishna reciprocated and became the enemy. You understand? Similarly, if you approach Krishna as the servant, he becomes the master. If you approach Krishna as a friend, he becomes a friend. If you approach Krishna as a lover, he becomes the beloved. Um, this is why he's the perfect form of Godhead. He perfectly reciprocates with the nature of the approach. As, a side, as an aside, this is the frustration of mundane relationships. No one knows how to perfectly reciprocate. So that is a Krishna's great quality. He knows how to perfectly reciprocate with the nature of the approach. And so the nature of their bhajan, just like we have this prayer, I don't, it is attributed to Bhakti Nam Thakur. I don't think he's the author of this song, but Mama Mana Mandere Raha Nishan, with the, the, the author, maybe it is Bhakti Nam Thakur, I don't think it is him though. Um, the devotee is praying, he's, he's wanting to perform Arti of Krishna. Shri Krishna Maharaj, Shri Krishna Maharaj. He wants to perform the Arti, and the temple, he's, he's comparing the Arti worship and the temple in which Arti is performed to his own faculty. So my mind is a temple. Please come and reside in the temple of my mind day and night. And then I will offer you the articles of my love. You know, the, the lamp is the, you know, the fire of prema, the tears coming from the eyes, just like the kanksha with the water. 
We're offering our love to Krishna. So he's performing arti with the contents of his own love. So the Bridger Bhaktis, they also perform worship by their love. Everything they do is actually worship. Every aspect of their existence is worship of Godhead. So they're worshiping Krishna by wanting to perform a Jata Karma ceremony. That's what I'm trying to say. They're worshiping Krishna by wanting to do a Jata Karma ceremony. Now, Krishna does not require the samskara. He doesn't require a rite of passage to activate, you know, characteristics that allow him to healthily function in the human world. No, he does not require, but he does actually require it. That is, that is the sweetness of our beloved Krishna. He actually does require it if your love requires it. And if your love requires it in reciprocation with their love, he also requires it. And so there's that the karma ceremony is going on. So here in this particular verse four, the importance of such some scars are being emphasized by giving a long list of comparisons um, to say that um, the rite of passage is indispensable for the living beings in this world. Starting with the Jatta Karma Samskara, actually it starts with the Gabbardham Samskara, but then afterwards the Jatta Karma Samskara comes up. So this is completely indispensable for the living entities for their healthy integration of the characteristics they need to be happy in this world. And without which they will suffer. Just like if, I, if you want water, then the meaning is you want pure water, isn't it? If I say, if you say I want some, a cup of water and I come to you and I say, well, do you want half contaminated water and half clean water? You say, no. Do you want one fourth contaminated water and three fourths clean water? You will say, no. You want four fourths clean water, isn't it? You don't want something that's partially contaminated. And when there's some contamination, a problem will come to you. So similarly in life, we require purification. It is indispensable. And without that purification, problem comes to us. So Parapa's opening sentence here in the purport, these are the Shastra conjunctions, how one can purify everything. Unless purify anything we use will infect us with contamination. And so there is a need. The point here is that the, the need for some scar is indispensable. Of course, for Krishna, from an ontological perspective, it is um, dispensable because he is God. But from the Rasa perspective, it is also indispensable. Some ceremony should be there for Krishna also. But the comparison is being made here for the soul and his sojourn through the world and how indispensable these um, some stars on these crossing of thresholds are for progress and for ultimate happiness. Otherwise, people just die in the starting in the starting point, so to speak. You have this. You have, and this is to explain this point a little, a bit more briefly. You have many statements in the Bhagavatam that criticizes the householder life. For example, famous one from Pralat Maharaj, He's telling his father that you should give up the house, which is an andupupam, a blind well, which destroys the soul, atma pata. It causes a degradation of the soul. But why is that? It is not that the house itself, by itself, is intrinsically causing the degradation of the soul. What it is, is that the objects in the house causes attachment to them, and it causes the soul to not want to cross the further thresholds that are needed for progress because you get attached to the starting point. Uh, so everywhere in life, this problem is there. In spiritual life also, this problem is there where you get acquainted with one stage of development and you become, it becomes familiar, it becomes comfortable, it becomes secure, it's known. And as a result, you become attached to that, attached to the familiar, the known, the comfortable, the secure. And everything outside of that starting point is just the opposite of that. It's unfamiliar, it's unknown, it's insecure, it's scary. It takes courage and it takes um, a, a tackling one's own ignorance to enter into that unknown domain. So usually, unless we're pushed into that domain, <laughs> then we probably won't cross that threshold. And as a result, we remain at the starting point and atma patam, there's degradation of the soul. So this is why, you know, there are many verses like this in the Bible time making critique of the household life, but it's not the household life. It's, some, it's, a, it's an external manifestation. It's used as a symbol of how the living entity gets stuck at the starting point and refuses to cross the necessary thresholds for further progress. He can't make an advancement. And that crossing of threshold is called some scar. So throughout life, there's so many some scars required. Another good one in the context of our devotional circle is initiation. This is a some scar that many 
Um, many devotees don't want to cross. I mean, I, at least I know many devotees who've been around for a while, but they're not taking initiation because it's scary. It's, it's, it represents, again, a sort of entry into the unknown from what is the unknown in this particular case, being the sovereign of one's own life and surrendering that sovereignty to God in the form of the guru. Because that is what diksha is. Diksha kale bhakta kare atma samarpana. One at the time of diksha is surrendering to God in the form of guru. Uh, God, guru is a form of God. And one is doing practical surrender to God by surrendering to guru at the time of diksha. So that is also a samskara that allows for progress in bhakti. Without that samskara, then progress would be minimum. At least I remember <laughs> Jai Dwight Maharaj was asked this question about what if you don't get initiated, but you, you like chant 16 rounds, you follow for regular principles. Like, and he said, it's something like um, auditing in class. You know, auditing in class. When you go to college, sometimes they allow people to audit a class where they can sit, sit in the class, they can take all the same tests, but no credit. <laughs> So you do bhakti without diksha, without crossing some, some scars, you remain stagnant, you remain stuck in the starting point. So in this way, to, to stress the point of the importance of these some scars for our continuous progress as souls in this world, this particular verse is being recited. And so anyway, in short, the first one says here, kalena. Kalena means by time, land and other material things become purified. Apparently, I, I don't know how all these some scars are being mentioned here at work. Snana shochabhyam, by bathing, the body becomes purified. If you don't bathe daily, then the body becomes contaminated, becomes a problem for you, and also becomes a problem for others. I go to Washington Square Park every day, and it's, you know, many don't get, I don't know if they don't get the chance to bathe or they just don't bathe, but. It is a problem for them and a problem for others also. For them, it is a problem because they become insane just by not taking bath. And then their insanity becomes a problem for the rest of us who are trying to read at the park and have a nice um, feeling that we're in nature, even though we're in this disgusting city. <laughs> Samskaraya, by purificatory process, the birth becomes purified. Not only the birth coming out of the womb, but your whole birth means your whole existence as a human being becomes purified by samskaras. I don't know at that point, I've already explained as best I could. Um, by austerity, the senses become purified. Otherwise, they become a problem for us. Adanta go bear vishatam to mishram puna punas chavra to chavranam. And Prahlad Maharaj is saying, same point actually, griha vritana, the vows remain in the griha. Uh, to remain at the starting point, try to enjoy the familiar and the secure. Then adanta go bear, the senses become untamed. Vishatam to mishram, and you enter hell. Not the literal hell, maybe that also afterwards, but your whole life itself becomes hell. Puna, puna, chavarna, chavarna. Showing that which has already been true. Uh, already trying something, seeing it doesn't work again, doing Because your senses are controlled. They haven't been purified by tapasya. Tapo devyam putra kanyena satnam. Shudyad. This is uh, Mishab Dei says also. Tapo divyam. Human life is meant for divine austerity. I forget how that verse starts. Naham, Nehadeha, I forget this verse. Tabodivyam by divine austerity. Putra Kanyena Sattvam Shudet. There is Shudet, pure purification of your Sattva, of your being, or beingness. So they don't do the tapasya, that becomes contaminated problem. Um, by worship of Brahmanas, <clears throat> it says by worship or the Yagya, Brahmanas become purified. Shudyanti. By giving in charity, um, then your wealth becomes purified. Otherwise, your wealth becomes a problem for you, uh, as is seeing the world over now. There's so many examples of that. And this one is very nice. Santushta, by satisfaction, the mind becomes purified. Mm -hmm. So this important, this some, some scar for the mind to become satisfied. And Dravani, um, I don't know what this one is. All material possessions such as cows, land, and gold. I don't know if this one has become purified by like cleansing them. The last one, Atmatma Vidyaya. The soul becomes purified by Atma Vidya. Atma Vidya means knowledge of the soul or ultimately means knowledge of Paramatma Tattva of God. The soul becomes purified. So in one trans, in one commentary, this verse, they said actually all these 
these examples of purification are being compared to this particular example. Just as objects become purified by cleansing them, the body becomes purified by um, taking bath, the mind becomes purified by satisfaction. In the same way, the soul becomes purified by Atma Vidya. So the soul who does not do the Atma Vidya, then his life is defeated. There's another verse from Yishab Day. Um, as so long as one does not do investigation into Atma Tattva, then that long his life is defeated by ignorance. And so you see in the world today, people trying to solve the world situation without purification, how they will do it. And it's not possible. When I, was, when I was in high school, they made us read a book called The, um, the Lord of the Flies. You know this book, Lord of the Flies, a very famous book. They made us study all these important books while we were too young to care about them <laughs> so that we wouldn't integrate anything. But part of the, this book is how the children or those who have yet to enter, yet to cross the threshold into adulthood, try to govern themselves. And the result is uh, complete chaos and, and destruction. So in the same way, humanity today is trying to find solutions to their problems, but they do not agree to become purified on an individual or collective level. So without the agreement to become purified by samskara, by yagya, ultimately by Krishna consciousness, how they will solve the problem. Prabhupada, in the science of civilization, he's interviewed by the one police officer in Chicago. So Chicago has always been infamous for being uh, a place of, uh, you know, war practically, <laughs> a lot of killing going on. So Prabhupada was giving a solution, how to solve the crime in Chicago. So Prabhupada said, give me um, facility to do mass hari now sankirtan and prashadam distribution. I will solve your crime problem in one month. So Prabhupada gave him, telling confidently. So obviously the police chief was like, what? How, how are you so confident? And one month I will solve your crime problem. And his point was very simple. He said, the reason they are criminals or uh, uh, having predilection towards criminality because they are not purified in mind. So by this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and by this Prasad Vishnu, they will become purified, your crime problem will stop. So without purification of the individual and collective psyche, then there cannot be any progress. That's the point that's being made in this verse. Without crossing the threshold of purification, which, you know, it, it hurts a little bit. It is a natural process of nature that when something is transforming, something else is kind of being dissolved. The classic image is a caterpillar becoming a butterfly but he has to cross through the threshold of the chrysalis. And in the chrysalis, his body is literally dissolved into like a protein goop. Yeah. It's like, when I read about the process, I was like, oh! That's why, that's why we naturally resist crossing thresholds because it, it is a process of dissolution. But if we don't get purified, then we develop neurosis, which ends up becoming the destruction of ourselves and of each other. So that's why devotees, we don't, like at least philosophically, we don't take very seriously all these social things. Uh, just in principle, I'm not even from a spiritual level, from a material level also, in principle, they are not to be taken very seriously because the individuals and in the collective do not agree to samskara. They do not agree to yagya. They do not agree to turn towards Krishna. That also they don't agree to. This chat, this Hare Krishna, eat prasad, that also they will not agree to. So how they will improve the situation? Uh, they cannot remain at the starting point and the neurosis that comes from lack of purification and also make the world a better place. That's not possible. So even from a material perspective, this is not to be taken very seriously. Of course, we get a little preoccupied. We have our opinions about it, whatever. But I'm just talking about from a strict, like strict bottom conception and not to be taken very seriously. Neither they will do samskara, neither they will do yagya, neither they will chant Hare Krishna. So why should we be taken seriously? Without purification, there cannot be any progress. So in this way, this verse is stressing the importance of these samskaras, even for Krishna. But of course, from the ontological reason, this is not important for Krishna, but from the perspective of Rasa, it is certainly very important. Uh, his, the, the love of his devotees creates the need in Krishna. But we get a point for us also how we need this for our journeys toward Beatitude. So I'm going to pause there and see if anyone wants to ask any questions. I think I've spoken enough. I did the best I could here.
Okay. That's right. You mentioned that Krishna doesn't need purification. Krishna doesn't need purification. You're saying Krishna engages in the samskara for the sake of taking the position under yoga maya so people can serve him. As Krishna can. takes the position of needing samskara and reciprocation with the love of his devotee. Okay. Right. Could we add? Could we add something to that? Certainly. Krishna undergoes some scar to set an example. Krishna undergoes some scar to set an example. Could that sure. be added? Says, you know, whatever great man does come. Whatever great man does come, man follows. So Krishna is also performing some scar, or having some scar performed to show that. That is also an angle. Why not? Krishna says as much in Bhagavad Gita chapter 3 that he follows the uh, rights of the Vedic culture in order to set example. If he doesn't set example, the world will be put into ruination. But we should know that fundamentally, whatever Krishna does is prompted by love only. There's nothing else that prompts his movement. So one of the important verses of Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9. So chapter 9, Krishna is speaking about the secret knowledge. Not secret, most secret knowledge. Uh, three degrees of secrets in the Gita. Secret, more secret, and most secret. So secret means Brahman. More secret means Paramatma Tattva. And most secret means Bhagavan. So in this ninth chapter, he's giving the most secret knowledge in relationship to his own nature. So one of the very important verses there, that in relationship to this world, he's completely neutral. Someone I don't favor anyone and I'm not envious of anyone. In relationship to this world, completely just neutrality. Like Paramatma, there's neutral. But, so that but means whatever I'm about to say is what's in my heart. But those who do my bhajan with love, then I am attached to them and they are attached to me. So this verse is making the point that it is only bhakti that causes the movement of the Lord and nothing else. There's no karma that can inspire the Lord's activity. It is the bhakti that inspires and, and reciprocation with that. Other things incidentally get also happen. Just like when you're cooking, suppose you're using firewood to cook. So when you're cooking, so many other things also get accomplished, like warmth in the kitchen. Suppose you're cooking in the winter, so you get warm. The firewood also burns to ashes. So many other things happen, but the main thing is the cooking of the, the preparation. So in Krishna Lila, the main thing is the activities of love and reciprocation with those who love him. And incidentally, so many other things are going on. Uh, setting example for the conditioned souls, this, that, and the other, but that is not primary motivation. That is something that happens without um, conscious um, preoccupation with it. So that means Krishna is not preoccupied how to set an example for the living entities. He can't set an example because the Lord Yeah, he, he, he sets an example incidentally for the living entities. And his activities are motivated by love for those who love him. That is his primary spirit. That is the Bhagavan Paramatma and the avatars that come through Paramatma, they are concerned with this work of maintenance of the universe. So that should be, this is the distinction between Krishna and Paramatma Tattva. On the Paramatma and the avatars, so Krishna speaks his verse in Gita, you all know it very well. Paritranaya sadhuna vinashaya tajuskrita dharma samstarpana tayasamava miyuge yuge. To liberate the devotees, to destroy the wicked, establish the principles of dharma, for this reason, I appear yuga after yuga. But this is actually the work of the avatars. This is not the work of the avatari. Um, this is the work of the avatars. They're concerned with universal maintenance um, because Krishna, Paramatma is the guna avatar of the sattva guna, the maintenance part, by not directly the deity, but by association. Brahma is rajagun, Paramatma is sattva maintenance. So these avatars, they're concerned with maintenance, but Krishna is not concerned with maintenance. He doesn't care about that, actually, directly. Indirectly, you can say he cares. There is no problem. But he does not directly care about that. He only cares about, he's only moved by love. That is the core Gaudiya concept of this. Mentioned right in the outset of Shaitan and Shaitan Mitta also. Um, when Krishna comes as the Yuga avatar, what is his point? Is it to propagate Yuga Dharma? So we always say that. When Krishna comes as Mahabharu, it's to propagate Yuga Dharma. Does he want to come and propagate Yuga Dharma? Uh, primarily interest is to propagate dharma from star pranataya to establish the dharma of the age is that krishna's motivation 
So his primary motivation, according to Kaviraj, is that he wants to distribute Braj Bhav. This is the external reason. His internal reasons have nothing to do with this world, but his external reason is like this. He wants to establish Braj Bhav, because huh? he says, life without love is useless. What is the point in living a life without love? It is useless and poor. And there's nice verses there in CC, Shishashakam. Life without love is poor and useless, they say. Therefore, engage me in thy service with love is thy pay or salary. So he said, without this love, what is the point of this whole cosmos? There is no point, actually. So he comes to distribute Braj Bhav. And he takes the position of the Yuga Avatar. Now, the Yuga Avatar is concerned with maintenance, Dharma, Samstar, Pranatai. So, the Yuga Avatars, they propagate the Yuga Dharma, which in the case of Kali Yuga is Hare Krishna Mahamasha. But Krishna wants to distribute praying. He's not so much caring about establishing Dharma. So, he takes the position of the Yuga Avatar to distribute Prema through the holy name. So, Kari Rash offers us this nice poetic verse where um, Krishna takes the holy name and the prem shakti, and he makes one garland. Huh? He, what's the word I'm looking for? Woes or wreath? Wreaths or robe, what? He makes a, he wreaths, robes, wreaths? I don't know what's the, what's the word, which one? Weaves. Weaves? Yeah. English is ghetto sometimes. Huh? <laughs> so he makes one garland and then he gives it to the world. His interest is not distributing Yuga Dharma primarily. His interest is giving Raj Bhav. And he takes the position of the Yuga Avatar to do something special for the living entities and giving them love. Mm -hmm. So this is Krishna, this is the distinction between Krishna and God. Uh, Krishna is a source of God. <laughs> Try to understand. Mm -hmm. There is God and then there's Krishna. So God is concerned with world maintenance and all this thing. And then there's Krishna. And he is just concerned with love. Uh, he say, dear Lalit, that is his primary personality. So Krishna is a source of God. And when Krishna comes as the function of God in this world, he does something special. So it looks like, oh, he's also performing the function of God. No, he's doing something special through the function of God. So there is a distinction there. It's subtle, but all of our charities have given so much thought on this. So example is also there. That is also incident incidentally there for those who can appreciate him as such, they will follow his example. They get benefit. But Krishna is a lover. All this rural stuff is not his main preoccupation. Okay, there's something online you want to ask a question. I see from Bhakti Devi, I see from Shishasha Kadas, I thought I saw for someone else. Okay, Bhakti Devi, right you below. Uh Prabhu, thank you. Uh, you're speaking about uh, the fact that sometimes Krishna acts like an ordinary human being. I also Not like that. All the time. <laughs> well, actually, I was thinking of a different example. You know, you say it reciprocates exactly according to what, how you, it's like a mirror. You approach him, he responds in the same way. Okay. But what about Brigu Muni and, and Vishnu? He kicked him in the chest. He didn't chop his head off. So, but the thing is, you know, that is also one of my favorite pastimes because, you know, so Brindavan Das Thakur, Brindavan Das Thakur, he retells his story in Chaitanya Bhagavad to give us the right import to the understanding. Um, Brigu is devoted to Bhagavan. He is not at all the enemy of Bhagavan. He kicked Vishnu to glorify Bhagavan. And so Bhagavan reciprocated with that devotion. So he tells the story. Otherwise, in the story, Vrindavan Das Thakur is telling the story for a particular point he wants to make also, which is a very important point. So when Brigham Muni goes to Shiva, he makes a, no, Brahma first. So he makes a mental apparat. Uh, Brahma wants to embrace him and he like crowns his face. So Brahma gets really upset and wants to kill him for that. Instead of Swati has to stop him. But Brahma is himself a great bhakta. So how he becomes so angry over something so small like this? Then later he goes to Shiva and he makes a verbal apparatus to Shiva. And he said, don't touch me. Ugh, you got this dust all over you. I don't, don't touch me. So Shiva became very angry and wanted to kill him. The Parvati had to stop. But Shiva was also a great bhakta. Why he would become so angry? So Vrindavan Asakur explains, they became angry because they wanted to bring glory to their Lord who was above them. Because that whole pastime was to show who was, who was more glorious. Was it Brahma, Vishnu, or Narayana, Vishnu? So they wanted to glorify that Vishnu is also my worship. So they showed anger. 
in order that glory will go to God. And then when he went to God, Brigu kicked him, inspired by the Lord to kick him to show his glory. How the Lord reciprocates with his devotee. So then Vrindavan asked Thakur gives a purport that when you look at a devotee from the material point of view, um, and you don't know if he is a great devotee or not, then you'll become in a, he uses the word sankata, means like a fix, a dharma sankata, a fix. Is he a devotee? Is he not a great devotee? Is he a devotee? You'll become in a fix. And if you come to the wrong conclusion, you will be destroyed. So Vrindavan Das Thakur warns us not to look at the devotees from the material point of view. You become in trouble because they're doing things like kicking their ayana. Of course, this is extraordinary activity. So if we see many people kicking the deity, it would be a little bit problematic. But so an extraordinary thing, Vrindavan Das Thakur is saying he was inspired by the Lord to bring glory to God. So the Lord was in fact reciprocating with Brigham Muni's desire according to the purport of the devotees. So Krishna is, again, he is a perfect reciprocator. That's what makes him the perfect object of love. Whereas everyone else will always have to fall a little bit short. You're in a sour mood and your, your beloved is trying to be like playful. Get off me. You're in a playful mood and they sour. They can't perfectly reciprocate. There will be some frustration. But Krishna is perfect reciprocator. Um, and so this is the poor portal according to the devotees. Well, could you answer one more question? Uh, you know, you're talking about Krishna's nature and reciprocating with devotees. And sometimes it seems like Krishna doesn't even know that he's God. Like when he's he's going into the Agasura, he, he's lamenting that the coward boys are entering the mouth. Like he, he doesn't really realize he's thinking what to do or, you know, so... Could you explain that a little bit? It seems inconceivable that he doesn't. It is inconceivable. Know. It is inconceivable. But you can see the topic um, covered somewhat co comprehensively in the second part of the Rav Bartman Chandrika. In short, the Lord is a repository of both omniscience and we'll use the language here, divine ignorance. Mugdhatta is the word used, but where he apparently doesn't know and he knows everything simultaneously. So to be an infinite reality means to have all contrary qualities residing in you. And that is what it means to be an infinite reality, that there can literally be nothing outside of you. So therefore he must be the resolution or the harmony between all contradictions, right? That is a ma major talking point of the Gaudiya Vaishnavas. So inside Krishna, you have both conscious and unconscious energies. For example, these are opposed to each other. Chit and Achit Shakti opposed to each other, but they both exist inside Bhagavan harmoniously. So also within Bhagavan, existing harmoniously is the quality of divine ignorance and omniscience. And therefore, even though he's lost in the play of love in the spiritual world, he also hears the prayers of his devotees in this world. That is the context in which this is brought up in the Raghavata Chandrika. Otherwise, the, the devotee in this world will want to know, is Krishna hearing my prayers? The Rag, the Rag, Raghunuga Bhakta, I am praying to Krishna. Does he hear my prayers? If someone gets answered, Paramatma in the heart is hearing. I'm praying to Paramatma. I'm praying to Krishna. So Sri Vishnu says, if he hears this, Paramatma hears your prayers, it causes pain to the heart of the Ravana Gubhakta. Sadhaka, I'm not praying to Paramatma. I'm praying to Krishna. Does he not hear my prayers? So to reconcile this, Sri Vishnu gives this point that the Lord is a repository of both uh, Mugdhatta, and I forget the other word, uh, the star, star, um, What's the word for omniscience? Sar, uh, anyway, Sarvagya, I think is the word he used. Yes, yeah, Sarvagya. Sarvagya, he knows everything. So, um, so it is inconceivable reality, but such is the nature of the infinite that nothing can exist outside of it. So everything is existing inside. Therefore, you know, Krishna is a house that the whole world can live in. So that's the irritating part. <laughs> when you are stuck on the dualistic platform that is irritating. Uh, so there's room for both right and left, Democrat or Republican, both can live in Krishna, what is the problem? Okay, there might need to be long calls and separate rooms, but everyone can be in the house of Krishna, there's no problem. Such is the nature of an infinite reality. He's the shelter of everyone, divine and demonic. Okay, Bhakti, uh, Bhakti you want to say, we kind of run out of time, but you can try. Um, just really quickly, um, just talk about being purified. Like, how do you know if you're purified? 
are, what are the characteristics? Are there levels of purification? Like, are you purified? And then one day you have your hand in the cookie jar and you're no longer purified? <laughs> <laughs> now good tell she comes to my classes. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, are different, there are different levels of purification, obviously. Um, the way we were talking about purification in today's class was more conventional purification as it was being discussed in today's verse. Some scars relates to uh, activating energies on the empirical domain that allows you to function healthy in the next domain. So I'm giving the example of, I gave the example throughout the class of going from adolescence to adulthood. If there isn't purification, a crossing of a threshold through some scara, then you act like a kid when it's time to be an adult. And so the result of how do you know you're not purified? You, are, you have all sorts of weird neurosis that sabotages your life in the here and now. And prevents you from making progress. This is, this is one indicator of a lack of purification. Uh, your life is constantly sabotaged by your own neurosis on a particular state. That's how we were speaking about it today. There is spiritual levels of purification also, but there is not any time to unfold all these details because now it's time for Darshan the Lord. So I hope that gives you some clue. Um, that's that. Thanks a lot. Jai Jagannath Prabhu Ki Jai. Next time we will not jai, we will not give him any verse to read. We'll just have him ask, answer our questions about that. What do you think? He's so qualified, uh, Jai Jagannath Prabhu. Okay, thank you very much. Happy Sunday, all of you. Whether you're on the right or on the left, you're all welcome. And Shiva Prabhupada's movement, no problem. That's Keep getting purified by the yagya of attending the class. Love you all. Are you both?